Today, I want to say a few words about race and justice in the American 21st century. I want to think about these ideas in the light of two quotations from the writings of Baha'u'llah. The first one is a statement of principle, and the second one is a metaphor. And so Baha'u'llah impresses upon us the importance of justice in his revelation when he says, the best beloved of all things in my sight is justice. And then he says, set it then before thine eyes. So the second quotation that I want to share is a metaphor that Baha'u'llah uses from time to time in his writings. And in it, he compares the human reality to a mirror which is capable of reflecting divine light, the attributes of God. And at one point in his writings, Baha'u'llah says, upon the reality of man, I have focused the radiance of all my names and attributes and made it a mirror of my own self. So with these two quotations in mind, I'll just share with you that for the past 12 to 13 years, I've been able to teach in various institutions throughout the world and in the U.S. And I work in this really wonderful profession because I get to see people who are transitioning, oftentimes from youth into adulthood, and they're gaining the qualities by which they are going to inherit and change the future. And for the last few years, about five years now, I've been teaching within the New York State prison system. And we often think about the prison as this place of deficit and darkness and sin and violence. And we often think that the people who are inside of this system are not fully human. But in fact, inside my prison classrooms, I see that light of divinity shining in the faces of my students almost every time I enter the razor wire. They reflect the attributes of love and justice and graciousness and wisdom, aspiration and joy. And I think it's perhaps easy for me to see this divine light shining in these faces because they look so much like the people who I grew up with, the people who are my best friends, who are in my family. In fact, they look a lot like me. And I want to drive home that point by telling you this quick story about a graduation that I attended inside of one of New York State's largest maximum security prisons. And so it was this wonderful occasion where people had been invited in to participate in the graduation ceremony. And I got to tell you a little bit about each of the groups that was there today, on that day. There were the prisoner graduates themselves, and they were gaining their associate's degree. It was about a dozen of them. They were sitting on one side of the stage, and they were decked out in the black and black regalia that is customary for the college graduate. And they were also joined in the audience by fellow inmates who were in the program but who weren't graduating that day. And they had on the green jumpsuits, which are standard issue to everyone in the New York State prison system. And then there were those of us who had been invited in to participate in the ceremony. And so there were a couple groups of us. There were the loved ones of those who were graduating. They were allowed to come in and participate in the event. And then there was also this donor class. The program was well endowed and it had been generously funded by people who had given of their own wealth. And they were invited in to participate in the ceremony as well. And they're in their suits and ties, as you can imagine. And then there were us the faculty, and we were in the black and black regalia that is customary for faculty to wear in college graduations. Except our regalia is a little bit different than that of the students who are graduating because we have on these hoods, and the hoods are festooned with the colors of our alma maters, the places where we received our PhD degrees from. And so their speeches are given and songs are played and everyone is milling about and having a great time. And out of the corner of my eye, I recognize that there's an older gentleman, one of the people who was probably a donor. He was approaching me. He made a beeline toward me. And as he approached me, I could see that his face was beaming and he extended his hand to mine and he shook my hand and he said, congratulations on your graduation. (laughs) So this good gentleman had assumed that I was a convicted criminal as opposed to a practicing professor. And I took no real offense to this mistake because, as I said, I share a lot of kinship with the people who I work with on the inside. So that wasn't really something that bothered me. Yet at the same time, I think that lurking within this mistake was a kind of bias about certain groups of people. The assumption that somebody who looks like me is more likely to be a criminal than a professor. And so I want to think about what happens when this kind of bias becomes expressed through social formations 
the social institutions which produce American society today. And we have some idea of what does happen when these biases get expressed in social institutions because for the last 20 years or so, social scientists have been doing research about bias and their expression within social institutions. And some of the findings are staggering, right? We know that black people and white people in America use illegal substances at about the same rate. They use and deal drugs at about the same rate as one another. Yet, black people are almost six times as likely to be serving prison time for drug-related offenses. Six times as likely. Let's think about how this bias manifests itself in institutions of education, where we know that particularly black boys are punished at really high rates compared to other demographic groups. And this doesn't just happen in high school or in middle school, right? This happens in preschool. Although black students make up only 18% of the American preschool population, they represent 48% of those who are suspended on multiple occasions. And now we're talking about four and five-year-olds, right? Let's think also in the medical profession, right? I know some of you in here are probably doctors or aspiring doctors, and what are you going to the field for? Some of y'all are going to make money, right? No, no. No one in here goes into the medical field to make money, right? You go into the field to help others, to help everyone who cross your path. Yet, what we find is some really startling evidence about the way that bias impacts the medical field. If a black person and a white person go into a medical institution complaining of similar pain, caused by a similar ailment, a white person is almost twice as likely to be prescribed high-powered opioid painkillers, right? Twice as likely. So what do we take out of this data? What can we learn from it? Well, I think there's a few things that we can learn. One is that these social institutions, which are key to the formation of American society today, they perpetuate old types of racism in new forms and patterns, right? That's one thing we should take away. The other thing that we should know is that oftentimes it's the people like the lawyers, the judges, the doctors, the teachers who are essentially good people, who don't have a racist agenda and who are not bigoted themselves, who are perpetuating this racism. But it's because of unconscious bias, biases that they have against certain people, usually poor, black, and brown. And these people are, for some reason, deemed less worthy of compassion and love, and more worthy of the harshest forms of social punishment that we have in this society. Another idea that I want to present to you today is that there may be two types of racism in operation in American society today, and that these two types of racism are inextricably linked, and yet they are identifiably separate. And I would say that there's this old style of racism, bigotry, that we immediately recognize when we see someone say something that's just out of control racist, right? Or when they use a terrible negative epithet about somebody's racial heritage or something like this. Or when we see some Ku Klux Klan people or some white supremacists marching in the street, right? We say, oh, that's some racism right there. I can identify that and I can oppose that. But I would say that, may, that there may be a more virulent and dangerous type of racism that exists and is expressed within our institutions, and that it may be hard for us to recognize, and that we don't often enough oppose it. And that maybe American society is like an ocean, and there is this dark, cold iceberg that floats in American society, and that's an iceberg of racism, and that the easily identifiable forms are like that 10% of the iceberg, which we can see above the surface of the water. But there is this massive bulk beneath the water, beneath perhaps the surface of our awareness that really needs to be addressed, and that carries forth racism in institutionalized and systematized forms. And I want to suggest that if we want to be at the front lines of the struggle against racial injustice in this day and age, we need to start addressing ourselves to this institutionalized and systematized forms of racism. And if we really believe that the best beloved of all things is justice and that the light of divinity shines in the face of every human being, then we need to figure out how we are going to present ourselves as change agents who are able to transform the social institutions in which we engage so that they work with justice, not just for some of us, but for all of us. Thank you.